The topic for today's tutorial is ultrasound in obstetrics. I'm Dr. Damien Best. Ultrasound is a key investigation in obstetrics and gynecology. It's quite a commonly used modality for both diagnostic purposes and for First, let's discuss how ultrasound works. Ultrasound uses sound frequencies which are above the audible range, hence the term ultrasound. So the audible range tends to be up to 200 kilohertz or 1000 hertz. And for medical applications such as ultrasound, we're using much more fast sound waves in the region of 1 to 15 megahertz or millions of hertz. <clears throat> so these sound waves are created through application of electricity to what we call ultrasound transducers or ultrasound probes, which contain in them piezoelectric crystals. And this application of electricity results in very rapid vibrations, which would produce the ultrasound waves which, which we're speaking. So this just shows us two examples of ultrasound transducers or probes. So wider array here is the type that we use for abdominal applications. So this would be applied to the mum's abdomen, obviously with some ultrasound gel. And this is the type we use for vaginal applications. And this is just an idea of how the physics is applied. So we have the transducer acting as both a sender and a receiver of the sound waves. The sound waves are going to travel through the tissue and bounce off of objects within the path, sending echoes back to the probe, which can be um, basically represented as images on the ultrasound screen. So yes, the sound waves are such that they can travel through the patient. And as they travel through the patient, they're going to meet different tissues along the way. The tissue is going to have different degrees of density or thickness, and hence impedance or blockage of the sound waves. So something that is more dense, such as bone, is going to basically reflect the sound waves much more strongly than something such as uh, liquid, like um, amniotic fluid. So uh, bone reflects brightly because of its high acoustic impedance and thus high reflectance of sound waves, whereas urine and amniotic fluid, because of low acoustic impedance, they're going to send back waves very poorly and appear as black on ultrasound screen. So as the waves are sent back continuously and interpreted into a picture, things that are moving are going to be representative as moving objects and giving you visual signals which can show you a continuous pattern of movement. For example, a fetus is moving. So first we can discuss routine antenatal use for diagnostic purposes. The first routine ultrasound performed in pregnancy would usually be the one we do at booking. That's the one of the early visits in pregnancy. And that will usually be between 11 and 13 weeks and six days. That is the end of the first trimester. The purpose of this ultrasound is many fold, but it's going to be a good time for us to determine whether or not the pregnancy is within the uterus, which it should be intrauterine confirm that it is what we call viable. So the viability of the pregnancy, that you have a heartbeat, and also to date the pregnancy. And to do that dating, we usually would, in the first trimester at this stage, up to 13 weeks and six days, measure what's called the crown to rump length. And the crown to rump length is the most accurate measure, ultrasound or even menstrual dates or otherwise, that we can use to date a pregnancy. This is an illustration, just a pictorial reminder, or, or just to show you what a crown to rump length is. The crown we take as the baby's head, and the rump, the tip of the bottom, so we'd measure in a straight line, that should give us the crown to rump length. 
and this is just to illustrate the concept of intrauterine pregnancy so the uterus usually we'll call this isoechoic or hypoechoic sort of area here it's shaped like a pear so this is the fundus of the uterus here and we've got here a cervix so within the body of the uterus we have an intrauterine gestational sac which is what we expect to see the sac will usually have a bright rim or a double rim what we call a decidual reaction if it's a true intrauterine pregnancy so bright rim and the sac is dark because of the amniotic fluid and this embryo in here with a yolk sac right so a small little circular sac within this bigger sac is a yolk sac and the embryos in here usually with cardiac activity to show that it is viable so this is an intrauterine pregnancy and this is what intrauterine pregnancy would look like extrauterine pregnancies also known as ectopic pregnancies because they're not located where they should be in the uterus tend to be outside of this usual wall structure so for example here we can see that this is separate from the uterus it doesn't have a very thick uh, muscular organ around it this is an ectopic gestation likely in the fallopian tubes and that's usually clinched when we if we can see an embryo there which this is likely with a heartbeat that confirms the diagnosis of an ectopic pregnancy pregnancy outside the uterus Usually you also look to see if you can see an ovary separate from the ectopic as well. Right. So crown to rump length for dating. If the crown to rump length is more than 84 millimeters, which it should be beyond um, 13 weeks, 6 days, then the pregnancy should be dated by the head circumference. That's the circumference of the fetal head, which is not as accurate as the crown to rump length. The general rule of thumb is that the earlier the gestation you can get a measurement, then the more accurate is the dating, right? So the head circumference to tend to be used if you get a pregnancy between 14 weeks and 20 weeks of gestation. All right, so here this underscores the point of early dating being a crucial landmark. So using the early dating from ultrasound with a crown to rump length, means that you should have pretty accurate dating to time the various events for the rest of the pregnancy so for example we get a ultrasound that gives us 10 weeks gestation we know when she's at 18 weeks she's at 18 weeks and she it's time for her anomaly scan for example or 24 weeks it's time for her um, diabetes screen right and we're pretty sure that's the correct dates so when we get to 41 weeks we know for certain that we have a prolonged pregnancy because we've had so much accurate dating from the very beginning so this early dating actually reduces the risk of the woman having a quote prolonged pregnancy beyond 41 weeks right the most common cause of finding a prolonged pregnancy is actually wrong dating right and obviously for prolonged pregnancies intervention is warranted so accurate dating with a crown up trump length should reduce that complication ultrasound can also be used for multiple pregnancy and that first trimester ultrasound 11 to 13 weeks we can use that to detect the number of fetuses and thus diagnose twins or higher order multiple pregnancies triplets quadruplets etc and also determine the chorionicity, which we'll talk a bit more about in a second. Chorionicity is basically the number of placental masses. So once we see uh, more than one embryo, we're going to measure each embryo's crown to rump length. The fetuses will normally be labeled fetus A, fetus B. And the larger of the two, I guess, would be considered as the further along or the more accurate dating. We use that one to date the pregnancy. All right. So for example, if we have one that is uh, 11 weeks and one day and the other one that is 11 weeks and two days in size, we will take the 11 weeks, two days and use that due date, All right? So that is meant to reduce the risk of estimating date from a twin which has early slowing of growth. 
As we said, the chorionicity is important to ascertain at that early ultrasound or as early as possible in a twin pregnancy or multiple pregnancy. And basically, the chorionicity refers to the number of placental masses. Uh, so placental masses, obviously, you know, uh, each fetus can have its own placenta or fetus can share placenta. And the if fetuses are sharing placentas, that presents a higher degree of risk. So the way to determine the chorionicity at this early ultrasound is to look for either a lambda sign or a T sign, right? A lambda sign or a T sign. So lambda sign is named because it looks kind of like the Greek letter at lambda, right? So we have here like a triangle, triangle base, and then we have the rest of the thick membrane coming up here. Right, and T sign basically we've got the placental one placental mass as opposed to two, and we've got the intertwin membrane basically meeting flush to shape like a T here. So the lambda sign means that two placental masses are approaching each other and inserting into the membrane, two sets of membranes. That is going to be a signal that this is a dichorionic pregnancy. So lambda sign dichorionic. T sign, one placental mass, this is going to be a monochorionic pregnancy. It, in the twin membrane means that the two amnions is a diamnionic, but this is a monochorionic pregnancy, right? So the chorionicity, though best interpreted at that gestation, could also be determined beyond 14 weeks definitely required. And the way to do that is to basically look at the number of placentas. So two placentas would indicate two, a dichorionic pregnancy, for example, as opposed to one placenta. And you also check on the baby's sex. That's only helpful really if you have a male and a female fetus, that would definitely be a dichorionic pregnancy. All right, uh, if they're the same gender, then looking at the placental masses should be a clue. As we mentioned, chorionicity is important to determine because monochorionic twins share their placental mass. They share one placenta, and thus they carry a three to four increased risk of dying in the um, late antenatal period, the stillbirth, and the early um, postnatal period, what's called the perinatal period, so perinatal mortality. And one of the re reasons that they are at increased risk of perinatal mortality is something called twin to twin transfusion syndrome, where because of um, abnormal arterial vascular, con arterial venous connections within the placental bed, one fetus might um, basically be perfusing the other fetus, right? So one twin would be the pump twin and the other one would be a recipient. It's an uneven sharing there. So one twin would become growth restricted and the other one would um, continue to grow normally. Both are at risk of death from heart failure. So quite important to recognize from early chorionicity. Next application of the first trimester ultrasound is screening for aneuploidy. And by aneuploidy, we usually mean things like trisomy 13, trisomy 18, trisomy 21. That is abnormal numbers of chromosomes. Remember, euploidy refers to 46 chromosomes. In these cases of trisomies, they have three copies of either of these chromosomes, which would mean that they will have a total of 47 chromosomes. So aneuploidy. So the background risk of aneuploidy tends to relate to maternal age. That is, the older the woman, the more likely she is to end up with a trisomy. Nuchal translucency measurement, which we'll see in the next slide, is used as part of the detection strategy when seen at 11 to 13 weeks of gestation. And it can also be combined with certain serum markers to form a first trimester, um, basically triple test. After 14 weeks, you cannot use nuchal translucency any longer because it tends to normalize. So here, this is an example of a nuchal translucency. Translucent obviously means see-through. So we've got a fetus in, uh, looking at it from off to the side, we can see the head 
and behind the neck is this space here it usually has to do with the development of the lymphatics and so on it tends to be thicker in down syndrome and other aneuploidies all right so this has a nuclear translucency of 2.9 millimeters in this particular slide so we tend to not to use a particular cutoff for gestation which would be in normalized charts um, you don't need to try to remember those they're not easy to remember right so anomaly screening is the next usual uh, scheduled visit for an ultrasound and that happens between 18 weeks and 20 weeks and six days so the end of the 20th week of gestation so this is quite smack dab in the middle of pregnancies usually late enough that most of the early miscarriages would have already occurred but not too late that uh, it's too late that if you have an abnormality that needs termination of pregnancy you, you would have to deny the woman so 18 to 20 weeks is a sweet spot to check for um, uh, structural abnormalities the baby should be large enough at this point uh, so they might pick up certain abnormalities associated with Down syndrome again even though this is not diagnostic but you basically these things are called short soft markers or normal variants so that is it could be forming no fully normal pregnancies things like nuchal fold not translucency nuchal fold thickness that's the thickness of the neck more than six millimeters ventricular megalily that's large uh, cerebral ventricles echogenic bowel so brightly appearing bowel or renal pelvis dilatation these are some of the soft markers which like I said are normal variants but can um, intimate that you might want to screen the patient for their risk of syndrome at the anomaly scan you can also look for cardiac abnormalities which are again common in things like Down syndrome but can be caused by certain medications can be otherwise congenital right uh, so can detect them by looking at this kind of view this is called a four chamber heart view and also by looking at outflow tracks and the detection rate for major congenital heart disease using this strategy is about 50 percent at the uh, anomaly scan you can also detect neural tube defects even though yes sometimes you can pick these up as early as the first trimester for example uh, 11 to 13 week scan you might realize there's an encephaly where you can't see the fetal skull and stuff developing at all but at the second trimester scan neural tube defects yes can be detected including things like spina bifida and lemon signs this head this skull is here shaped like a lemon could be an indication or banana sign which is a kind of a cerebellar looking sign that looks like a banana can be indicative of, of spina bifida for example but yes as mentioned anencephaly can be detected at the dating scan right so if you see an mcq it says to you you know these are the reasons for doing a 11 to 13 week scan and what can you detect and they say major abnormalities this is what they're talking about you can detect things like anencephaly right encephalocele that's fluid filled sacs or brain filled cysts you know, such as in your spina bifida or your myelomeningo seals and so on you can also detect at that 18 to 20 week scan right so the next diagnostic modality or screening modality or screening reason for ultrasound basically you can try to predict the risk of preeclampsia increased resistance in placental circulation is associated with preeclampsia as well as fetal growth restriction which is which is basically a slowing in the baby's growth due to uh, placental problems right so the lower the resistance in the placental circulation the better is the baby's growth then there's higher resistance you're more likely to have fetal growth restriction previously known as intrauterine growth restriction and the growth in fetal growth restriction from placental circulation problems it tends to be what we call asymmetrical fetal growth restriction where the head is spared the abdomen is small prediction of preeclampsia though it tends to boil back down to looking at the uterine artery the uterine artery doppler all right so they call this interrogation of the of the dopplers by interrogating the uterine arteries at the mid gestation that's just about 20 weeks as well if you see something called notching 
that would identify up to 40% of women in a low risk pregnancy who would later go on to develop preeclampsia notching. All right, so usually this would be pretty smooth here. If you look at the uterine artery, you get obviously systole, the end diastolic flow. It should be kind of smooth. When you see this notch, right, and you see that in both sides, that's bilateral notching of the uterine artery, and that is a predictor of preeclampsia. Next thing is placenta location. So when you do your 20 weeks ultrasound, you can see the placenta quite clearly and you can determine the location. And by location, we really want to know maybe is it anterior or posterior, but more importantly, is the placenta low lying, meaning is it close to or covering the internal cervical os or cervix? Because a low lying placenta can present problems later on if it remains low or placenta previa later in the third trimester, which is why in the third trimester, if you see a low at the second trimester scan, you need to do a confirmatory scan to determine where the placenta is and if it is a previa at that point. All right? So I'll say that again. If the placenta is low lying at 20 weeks, as in close to the cervical os or covering it, you would need to do an ultrasound in the third trimester to confirm whether it is now a placenta previa, right? Because we don't know that there's a phenomenon known as placental migration, where the placenta may seem to be low in early pregnancy, but in fact is implanted high in the uterus. So when the uterus expands, you see that the uterus is, the placenta is, is at the fundus. But some placentas, particularly the ones which are, you know, over, encroaching on the cervix, overlapping, or completely covering uh, central are less likely to have that migration. So you would repeat scan for these more, what we call major um, previous, around 32 weeks. The more minor ones, the ones that are marginal or you know simply just low lying within five centimeters can be repeated at around 36 weeks gestation. All right, so the first clue is the 20 week scan, you might see it low lying. You need to do another scan at between 32 and 36 weeks, determine if the scan, the placenta is now previa. And the transvaginal ultrasound, such as this, allows you to clearly see the cervix. So we can see that this is a cervix, a tube like structure. This is a cervical endometrium. We can see the relation of the edge of the placenta, which is here, to the internal os, which is here. So this is completely covering the cervix. This is a major placenta previa, complete previa, kind of asymmetrical because the placenta is up here. So this is from under the old schemata, a type three previa. But still, um, if you're talking major minor, this is a major previa because it completely covers the cervix. The next thing about the placenta that can be diagnosed is a placenta accreta. And these are more common in women that may have had um, a caesarean section or a myomectomy before some sort of entry into the uterus and the placenta implants over that old scar and actually becomes buried into the muscle of the uterus such that it's not going to easily separate or not separate at all when it's supposed to come out after the baby's born. So placenta accreta is what we call an invasive placentation. All right. So the placenta has invaded and penetrated into the muscle of the uterus. So the risk here, because the placenta doesn't separate, is that the uterus is not going to contract properly. And maybe the edge separates a little bit. You're going to have risk of massive bleeding and risk of hysterectomy, having to remove the uterus in order to save the woman's life because of all this massive bleeding. So some clues on ultrasound, usually there would be uh, space or a little echolucency, sonolucency between the placenta and the myometrium where it would separate, you lose that. So that's all gone. Um, maybe some lakes or lacunae within the placenta. All right. And sometimes the bladder being anterior, placenta previa, accreta being anterior, you might get some exophytic masses going into the bladder. All right. So yes, Placenta accretors are usually anterior because obviously with the previous cesarean section, the scar is anterior, the bladder is anterior as well. So you look for those lakes, 
loss of the regularity of the solute zone and exophytic masses in the bladder will suggest a or morbidly a hyperpacenter. So ultrasound is also useful for prevention and therapy. So one of those um, monitoring uh, monitoring applications is assessment of fetal growth because if you're estimating the fetal size strictly from palpating, touching the abdomen, measuring, you're not in all cases going to have an accurate or reliable measure of if the fetus is appropriate size based on the mum's habitus, based on the amount of amniotic fluid and so on, you might get a smaller or larger region than you would like, anticipate. So in order to assess the fetal growth, you can uh, you can give the lady growth scans for the fetus, and in those you will measure by parameter diameter or BPD, the head circumference, the abdominal circumference AC, AC and femur length. These are the four um, biometric or biometry parameters. Biometry, when we talk about biometry, we're talking about BPD, HC, AC, and FL. So this is demonstrates a BPD. So we have one parieta eminence at the other one. So you can go from outside of one to the inside of the next one. Head circumference. The circumference is the area all around. So you go right on the outside of the calvaria. Abdominal circumference. Again, a circumference right all the way around the skin of the abdomen. Here at the level of the stomach and at the level of level of the hepatic portal vessels. And the femur length is basically a straight line drop to the fetus, the femur, look at that, it's like entire length, and you uh, use all those four, they usually go into something called Hallox formula, that should give us an estimated fetal weight, right, so the parameters can be plotted um, basically uh, on their own, each on their own, to determine the appropriateness of the size of the fetus for the gestational age, and those can also be plotted on charts, and given as percentiles or or basically standard deviations from the mean and any fetus within two standard deviations in the mean or between the 10th and 90th centile would be appropriate for gestational age or each biometric parameter would be appropriate for gestational age. The four in combination can give you an estimated fetal weight which again you can get standard deviations and you can get percentiles. So fetus which is above the 90th centile would be large for gestational age. And a fetus which is less than the 10th centile would be small for gestational age. And this is just demonstrating again Hadlock. Estimated fetal weight in grams, and gestational age on the, on the x-axis. You tend to plot the estimated fetal weight. If you get it between the 10th and the 90th, then that is the appropriate size. Outside of those, or out with those, you've got a small, less than the 10th or large for gestational age of more than 90th respectively. Now, as much as we would like to have great confidence in estimation of fetal weights using Hadlock's formula, we do know that there is some margin of error as much as 10 to 15 percent and thus and therefore despite the fact that you might want to diagnose macrosomia from that, you have to understand that there may be some error there where a fetus might actually be normally grown and read as macrosomia and the larger the fetus is, the more likely, is, more likely is this error to occur. Just also remember that a small for gestation of age fetus, which is less than tensile, would include um, fetuses which are constitutionally small. So they're small because of their genetics, maybe they have small parents, etc., and their growth is appropriate. But on the flip side, they can be small due to pathology, and that's one we call fetal growth restriction or IUGR. Right? So utero placental insufficiency, the ones that usually are later on in cells, will produce your asymmetrical IUGR, where the head is spared and the abdominal circumference is small, so you have a uh, normal, sorry, maybe a larger head circumference to abdominal circumference ratio, HC to AC ratio. An earlier insult, however, maybe one that's early in pregnancy, like a chromosomal abnormality or, you know, a torch infection or something, the fetus tends to be more symmetrically small. So the head circumference is the same size for gestation as is the abdominal circumference, for example. 
So the HC to AC is basically normal, right? So if you have a small for gestational age fetus, you are going to employ a strategy of serial growth scans, basically because you can only diagnose growth restriction or slowed growth as a kind of a linear something. So you have to do more than one measurement. You can't look at one measurement and say that the baby is not growing. You have to do more over time because growth is linear. So you have to do serial growth scans. Usually if you are doing maybe four weekly scan because of risk, like in a diabetic or in a twin, if you're doing four weekly scans and you find that the baby is small statistically, you're probably going to increase the frequency of serial growth scans to every two weeks. And every two weeks is also good timing to do umbilical artery Doppler ultrasounds. So umbilical artery Doppler can repeat you that one to two weekly intervals. If you have severe growth restriction, then you might want to do it a bit more frequently than that, or even daily if there's the phenomenon known as absent absence or reversal of end diastolic flow. So this is a concept. We mentioned that placental resistance should be low so that blood is always flowing in the umbilical artery supplying uh, sorry taking blood back to the, the, the placenta from the fetus so blood should always be flowing at systole during diastole and straight up to the end of diastole so this is a normal umbilical artery Doppler here is a zero line and we've realized that blood is always flowing it's always positive so here again we have a normal at the top or maybe if this is the end of diastole, we have it creeping down towards the line, we might have re reduced end diastolic flow or REDF if this resistance to blood flow is greater. But if the resistance is even more increased than that, you might find that during diastole, blood stops flowing. And that is fairly ominous to say that there's significant resistance in the central um, circulation and the fetus is at risk of perinatal morbidity, mortality, if the pregnancy is prolonged. So this is a baby that is screaming for help, basically, and probably needs some sort of intervention soon. What's worse than absence of in diastolic flow, higher resistance is that if the blood starts to flow back towards the fetus during the end of diastole, such as here. So this is reverse reversal, reversed end diastolic flow. And this baby will have um, worse perinatal morbidity and mortality, even if delivered right away. Okay, so when we're doing surveillance of umbilical artery Doppler, we're looking to catch um, the baby and deliver after maybe steroid and so on, while we still have, you know, maybe even ab um, reduce end diastolic flow at worst, absent. Reverse, that means that basically the baby should come now, but the baby's risk is still quite high, delivered on. Other ways of manager, monitoring fetal well-being, you have a biophysical profile, which basically is a combination of five parameters, four of them are ultrasound, which is the topic of the tutorial, of course, and one of them is a fetal cardiac monitor, or NST, non-stress tests, uh, which uses a cardiotopograph machine. So the four biophysical ultrasound pre features and the one NST feature, each scores a maximum of two. So two means baby good, baby not so good in that feature, the baby at zero for that one. So you either get two or zero. So if the baby has good tone, good gross movements, good breathing movements, good amniotic fluid volume, that is 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 is 8 on the ultrasound and if the non-stress test is normal they score 2 for that all right so 10. so scores of 8 or 10 overall are reassuring a score of 6 or less would need re-evaluation further evaluation or perhaps early delivery so as we mentioned you have these four ultrasound parameters fetal movements fetal tone, fetal breathing movements, and amniotic fluid volume. And these basically would take up to 30 minutes to assess because breathing movements, 
sometimes take a while to see, but those are always reassuring. And 30 minutes is the amount of time you usually would use. Formal use of the biophysical profile has now become uncommon. Why? Because it is time consuming. Yes, it needs at least 30 minutes in order to complete. There isn't enough evidence for routine use. And there's no significant change in the perinatal mortality or APGAR scores. That is the outcome of the baby when compared to using things like the NST alone. Uh, so without a change of perinatal mortality or APGAR scores, there seems to be an increased rate of caesarean section and induction of labor, right? With biophysical profile, hence why it's not no longer in common use. Amniotic fluid volume, basically the amount of amniotic fluid or light core around the baby. There are three main techniques used to estimate this. So one is using the amniotic fluid index, two is the deepest vertical pocket, and three, subjective assessment. And none of the three have been shown to be accurate compared to volumes which are measured when um, collecting fluid at the caesarean section. So for the amniotic fluid index, you basically divide the mum's abdomen into four quadrants using the umbilicus as a demarcator. So if this is the umbilicus here, drop a vertical line, drop a horizontal line, and you're going to hold the probe um, vertically and measure the deepest pocket. One, two, three, four quadrants. And you add those together. If normal being somewhere between eight and 10, up to as much as 24. So you get less than eight, you're concerned about oligohydramnios. More than 24, you're concerned about polyhydramnios. And the deepest vertical pocket would usually be, uh, if you just take one quadrant as the deepest and measure it, that would be taken as the deepest vertical pocket. So if it's less than two centimeters, that might be oligohydramnios, more than eight probably poly. Subjective assessment would just be looking at and saying, hmm, this looks like increased light core subjectively, or this looks like reduced light core. All right? but none of them have improved to be more accurate or or um, exceedingly accurate when compared to actual measurement at caesarean section, as we mentioned. Another um, test using ultrasound is measurement of the cervical length. So this is showing us a transvaginal ultrasound. Like I said, cervix is kind of barrel shaped. So we've got this um, hypoechoic area here. We've got endometrium, and what we're measuring is from the tip of the external os along the endometrium of the cervix right here to the internal os. This, of course, is the baby's skull or head against the cervix, which is closed along its length. All right. The length of this cervix, according to this, is 4.06 centimeters, which is reassuring. So it is used as a predictor of preterm delivery. So you have a patient who maybe had preterm labor before or you know, needed a circlage before in a previous pregnancy, and you suspect they are at risk of preterm labor, you can do a cervix length or monitoring of cervix length serially at visits, maybe every two weeks or so. And a cervix which is longer than 2.5 centimeters or 25 millimeters at 24 weeks, we can say basically that means that there's low risk of this woman going to preterm labor. All right? So a long cervix, more than 25 millimeters, low risk of preterm labor. A short cervix at higher risk of preterm labor, you probably should do something to reduce her chance. Among those options are things like use of supplemental progesterone, like progesterone injections, or use of a cervical circlage on a case-by-case -case basis to try to prolong the pregnancy. Therapeutic-wise, um, I guess ancillary diagnostic-wise, ultrasounds can be used to guide certain procedures. To assess fetal anemia, for example, in cases of suspected rhesus alloimmunization, we can measure another Doppler, which is the middle cerebral artery Doppler, the peak systolic velocity in the middle cerebral artery Doppler, PSV, MCA Doppler. And if you suspect fetal anemia from that, you know, you get a 
value which is above one and a half multiples in the median, then obviously you can do further procedures like um, fetal blood sampling, which is ultrasound guided as well. And the fetal blood sampling can be followed by ultrasound guided fetal blood transfusion once you have a needle there in the umbilical vessels. All right. Ultrasound also used to guide fetoscopy, which is direct visualization of a cervix of a fetus using a, a camera, or selective fetal reduction or fetocide in multifetal pregnancies. Right. So this is just illustrating a handheld um, ultrasound transducer, abdominal transducer being used to guide introduction of a um, needle to do fetal blood transfusion, you know, trying to avoid trauma to the placenta going directly into vessels and the fetus that probably would have had some, a little bit of muscle relaxation using pancronium or something. <clears throat> So ultrasounds can also be used intrapartum. So that is while delivery is being conducted or during labor. It's been shown to be more accurate to determine the fetal head position. That is the relation of maybe the occiput to the mum, like an occiput anterior or, or, or right occiput anterior. It's shown to be more accurate to determine the position than using your fingers to feel the occipital this is the occiput and the um, posterior fontanelle. That might be due to, um, you know, caput and molding and those kind of things. It also has been used in the second stage to monitor placental separation. So there's usually a loss of blood flow from the muscle, the myometrium, into the placenta when the placenta separates for obvious reasons. And that can be seen. So to end, Ultrasound is an established and quite useful tool in obstetrics. Techniques have improved, resolutions have improved, meaning that findings have become more accurate and we're able to apply it in many more um, ways. And this has led to overall outcomes, improved outcomes for both mothers and fetuses. This being an online recorded tutorial, there shouldn't be any questions. Thank you very much for your time.